Hello, everyone. Really good to see all of you. It's um, it's an interesting experience doing a shared learning forum uh, over Zoom. So really happy to be doing this, though, because uh, we always love the shared learning forum. It's such a great chance for staff to have access to resources, share information. And we are really, really excited to share our information with you today. Um, you'll be learning all about it. We have a PowerPoint. So we're going to go kind of back and forth between sharing some of our PowerPoint and talking. And then we really want to speak to you at the end. We're interested in hearing from you guys. Before I get started with that, I would love it if you guys can listen for one minute. Uh, Jason, is there any way we can spotlight Paul Cochran's um, video for just a quick moment? One second here. Now I'm having a tech glitch. Here's what I want to uh, say to Paul. <laughs> Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Paul. Happy birthday to you. <laughs> Can everybody say happy birthday to Paul Cochran? Paul is 16 years old today, right, Paul? Yep, 16 is old. Yep. So Paul uh, Trooper is here on his birthday. <laughs> so I wanted to start off with that. Thanks everybody so much. Um, amazing, Paul, you're getting all kinds of nice comments in the chat function there. Thank Happy you, birthday. birthday. Oh, look at that, Paul. You're a star. Everybody's giving you. I know. <laughs> Happy birthday. So Thank why you. don't we get right to our presentation? And, um, and we were, as I said, we're gonna go through um, uh, some results. So. You're here today because we are extremely excited to be sharing the results of an evaluation project that we've been working on for the last year. And that evaluation project is on the decision-making rights of persons with intellectual disabilities, like Hina said. So you'll meet our whole team. I'm just going to begin sharing a screen here and uh, we will go through, and this is a bit of a guide track for us. Um, <clears throat> So one second here, we'll start our little slideshow just uh, to give you information. Um, so everyone, and by the way, you'll probably notice that there's a little line of images um, to see the faces. Uh, you can always minimize the thumbnail video if you like while we are looking at the PowerPoint, um, but you can also just um, listen along. So we are respecting rights. Um, we are here to tell you about My Voice, My Choice, phase one, which is the first phase of an evaluation report that we've, um, we've just had done. We're going to talk about a few things today. Here's a bit of an agenda. We're going to talk about our stoplight cards. We're going to talk about Arch Disability Law Center, what is respecting rights, our team, research questions, the results of our evaluation on decision-making rights, and what's next. And then we really look forward to having a discussion with you. There will be an opportunity for questions. Um, Jason and Deanna will be operating, taking questions at the end, and we can have time to unmute you and you can offer a question. You can also use the chat function to, um, to use those questions. So we really wanna have a bit of a discussion from you about our next phases. Now we are going to ask Shanika, our self-advocate Shanika, um, and this is a standard practice at Respecting Rights, is just introducing with our stoplight card. Shanika, can you just say a couple words about these? Uh, these are accessible. It's just like uh, you see a, a stoplight outside, you have your red, yellow, and green. You mean the, the red one means is to, you know, stop, you have to use plain language that everyone can understand. And the yellow one means slow down and you're going like the yellow one means you're going too fast and the, the green one means you're at the right pace and we believe that everyone should be accessible to these cards and even at home if you can find a ketchup something that's red and something that's green at home that is a like a cup and um, something that is yellow like a lime or a pencil that you can <laughs> find at home to use it so everyone should be uh, accommodated and accessible as well. 
Thank you, Shanika. And uh, so, as Shanika said, we do like to use these stoplight cards. Uh, this is a practice of ours with our self advocates, and we've uh, had to shift during the pandemic. So rather than using these cards that everybody normally brings to our workshops, we've asked people to get, like Shanika said, a yellow item, a green item and a red item. Um, that's part of our accessibility work. Um, all of our workshops and presentations we do for self-advocates, we use these. However, this is a rare one. We don't present to staff very often, but staff are important too. You guys are important. So that's why we're doing this. So. If you do have concerns, enter in the chat function or save the question, take a note, have a little notepad beside you, take notes and then enter that into um, the chat function at the end when Deanna does uh, question and answers. Um, Hina. Hi, so my name is Hina. I'm a lawyer at Arch Disability Law Center. Uh, I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about Arch. So ARCH is a specialty legal clinic in Ontario and we practice exclusively in disability rights law. So we're the only clinic of its kind in Ontario actually. And we've been dedicated to defending and advancing the rights of persons with disabilities for about 40 years now. Uh, we're primarily funded by Legal Aid Ontario as well as some other funding sources and we're also governed by a volunteer board of directors, a majority of whom are persons with disabilities. <clears throat> so I'm just gonna talk to you briefly about some of the services that ARCH actually offers. So ARCH engages in what's called test case litigation. So these are those cases that affect a large number of people with disabilities or those that will significantly affect the law as it relates to the rights of persons with disabilities. So that's the main type of litigation that we practice. Uh, we also engage in a lot of public legal education. So what this is, is we provide legal education, mostly to persons with disabilities about their legal rights, as well as about new developments in the law. So we do this through offering presentations, workshops, seminars, and we also produce written materials. So in terms of our publications, we have a variety of different types of publications. For example, we have fact sheets, which are normally a question that we get commonly asked and we do like a one or two page fact sheet. We have guides, which are a little bit more substantive um, in an area of law. Our position papers and submissions are also all available on our website. And then we also have these things called toolkits. And these are a more practical way for uh, persons to engage in various uh, advocacy strategies. So for example, near the beginning of the pandemic, we came out with an advocacy toolkit about advocating for your support person, attendant, or communication assistant to be with you while you're in the hospital, because that was a huge issue right at the beginning. Uh, also, as part of our publications, we have our quarterly newsletter. It's called the Arch Alert, and this has news and information on disability issues and updates to Arch's work. Our next one is actually supposed to be coming out at the end of September, so just letting you know about that. And the last service that I want to talk to you about is called the Summary Advice and Referral Service. So this is a free and confidential legal service that we provide directly to persons with disabilities from across Ontario. So we provide information on certain disability related areas of the law, for example, discrimination, human rights, decision making rights, so we've gotten calls about, you know, the right to exercise uh, your capacity to make your own decisions or the rights of a person living in a group home. So this is a really good resource that you can tell people that you support. So if they need have any legal questions or need to navigate for some referrals, they can always call ARCH. And some of you may have um, called ARCH. Um, as Hina said, uh, ARCH is really driven by contact with people with disabilities, not with families, not with staff. So, um, and obviously people, as Shanika said earlier with the stoplight, have the right to be accommodated. So if someone has a support person that they need to bring with them to ensure that they're 
communicating, then Arch makes sure that that happens. Um, feel free to enter into the chat function if you've supported someone to contact Arch about their rights. And I think it's great that Hina outlined the test case litigation so you can understand um, there's a number of cases that Arch doesn't take on, uh, but Arch would refer you to the, the right place to go for that. Um, so that's great. Okay. Um, and um, Alrighty, and I'm, I'm going to speak about this slide. So respecting rights is a group of people. Do you see the ice cream cone there? Normally Shanika talks about this. I'll do it real quick just in the, in the name of time, but the, the ice cream cone has three flavors, right? So the triple scoop approach is what respecting rights does. Lawyers, self-advocates, social workers working together. Okay, so that's very important for us that we have those three perspectives. Um, so we're going to talk to you today about my voice, my choice, evaluating decision making rights. And we've done this in Central, Eastern and Western Ontario. Um, respecting rights again is rights education project led by people with disabilities and in this project, My Voice, My Choice, we wanted to learn how people with intellectual disabilities are supported to make their own decisions. And again, this is all in the context of their legal rights to do so. Um, I'll say one or two things. Simply thank you to the Ontario government for funding My Voice, My Choice and Respecting Rights. After the Heronia class action lawsuit, the leftover funding that was available for new projects, we applied for it and we're very grateful to receive it. Um, and part of part of this, we are committed to using the funding to helping people um, improve their access to decision making rights and to learn about their right. Hina, do you want to add anything else about the the lawsuit? Um, just that the lawsuit was it was the Heronia Regional Center, which was not the only large institution run by the province of Ontario. So these were these were called Schedule One institutions. I'm sure a lot of you know all about the history. Uh, it was under the formal former Developmental Services Act, and actually at the height of institutionalization, I want to say there were about 30 large and small institutions for persons with intellectual disabilities. And when it, they started to be exposed as places of abuse and inhumane treatment, they started to close down. With the last one actually closing down in 2009 which I always find such a surprising fact. And I imagine a lot of you who are here um, followed all of that really clearly and probably supported um, a lot of people to apply um, during, that, uh, during that class action lawsuit. And Peter Park is not with us today. He's one of our, um, he's one of the founding, founding members of Respecting Rights. Um, there's Peter Park right there with Crystal. Um, so we'll just say a couple of things about this and um, just thank you to our team. So with Respecting Rights, we have a core team. You're about to meet them. Everyone's gonna introduce themselves in one minute. But the work that we did with this My Voice, My Choice evaluation project, self-advocates made role plays from stories about their lives. And then together we turn these into scripts. We turn those into videos to help other people learn about their rights. Self-advocates learned practice skills of peer support. So people were learning how to really support and listen. You guys, I'm gonna ask you a few questions about those exercises we did and listening, really focusing, hearing what someone's saying and then responding with support, right? This is the kind of practice we're doing. So in the workshops that we did, we'll tell you about it a little bit um, and show you some pictures of those workshops, but these self-advocates that you're about to meet went out and met with other self-advocates, led them through role plays, and then heard stories about their challenges in making their own decisions. Um, so you'll get to know everyone in just a moment. Um, okay, so there's a photograph, and then I'm just gonna turn off the, the uh, screen share so you can meet everybody, but we have Shanika and Paul and Crystal with us. Peter Park is unfortunately unable to be with us today, and so is Marissa Blake. These are our five core self-advocates who have been learning peer support skills, who have been supporting self-advocates across the province to stand up for their rights and learn about their decision-making. 
And these guys have also informed all of the videos, written scripts. Um, we've been working hard. <laughs> and these guys have really been working hard. So Jason, I'm just going to ask you if you can spotlight one by one. Um, can we start off Shanika? Can we spotlight Shanika? So we'll just see Shanika's video. And um, so when that comes up, Shanika can introduce herself and you guys can meet the amazing Shanika, who's been a self-advocate. There's Shanika. Shanika, can you introduce yourself for everybody? You're Hi, on I'm, candid camera. I'm Shanika. It's nice to meet all of you on, on uh, camera. It's also nice to see all of you on uh, camera. I feel like I haven't seen all of you, but uh, it's good to be here on this Friday morning. So if you guys have a good day, and I'm Shanika. <laughs> Shanika has been totally, totally involved and instrumental in doing this. And Shanika also, uh, Shanika, can you tell people your work as a counselor? I mean, oh, you're not I also got yeah. my community service diploma. I mean, back, back in 2019, so I was juggling with work and going to school to study to become a social worker. And hopefully when everything comes down, I am planning to go back to school to do more social social worker because I want to be one of those counselors who cares about the people you know not not there for a check but care for the people so I'm also looking into doing some courses in university or college amazing and Shanika you're getting some nice comments people are saying nice to meet you yeah Shanika's pretty amazing um and I'll say that you know as we did our peer support work Shanika was such a great ear for self-advocates across the province um and we're going into our next phase soon, so you're going to hear more about what Shanika is going to be doing. Can we go, um, Jason, can we possibly um, uh, spotlight Crystal? And then we can end off with our birthday boy. <laughs> <laughs> if we can spotlight Crystal. And Crystal, and some of you might know from the screen, if you've been, um, you know, happened to see her on television or film, uh, we're so lucky to actually have an actress with us um, because of all the role play that we're doing. Crystal, can you introduce yourself? Yes, hi, I'm Crystal. I'm at Respecting Rights. I'm an, I'm an, an advocate of me having Down syndrome, but that does not stop me. I am also, um, I am also a, an actress in film and television and, and in theater, and, and, and you can search me on the internet and YouTube. Exactly, exactly. People can see you. And do you know what we should also do, Deanna or Jason, if you guys have an opportunity, or Hina, might even be neat to um, just input into the chat function the Respecting Rights page where we have all of our videos. And you can see Crystal on those videos. So um, thanks, Crystal. Amazing. Yep. You're going to be hearing more from Crystal. Can we spotlight Paul Cochran? The birthday boy. <laughs> Look at the birthday boy. Uh, Paul, can you introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. Nice, nice to see everybody this morning. My name is Paul. I'm from the Spectre Rights. I work with Sue Hutton, he and I, with the lawyers, and everybody else. And Paul, Paul has a long history of supporting people. Paul, you are one of the people, self-advocates have really learned about the importance of privacy and confidentiality. Shanika is yes. constantly reminding people about the importance of confidentiality as her training as a counselor. And Paul's been amazing at that in supporting people when they have concerns, right? And being really respectful and keeping it private. So that's another big thing. Paul, you've been so fantastic at that. Zoe has just entered into the chat function. Um, the Arch Disability Law Center Respecting Rights page. Feel free to um, check that out, bookmark it for later. Um, there are great videos um, that you'll see all of these guys and you'll be like, wow, they are Academy Award winners. Um, okay, so thanks so much for introducing yourselves, guys. We're gonna keep going. Uh, Crystal, uh, who's in the room here? What's going on here, Crystal? Can you tell uh, us? I think, yeah, that is the 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 the, Lon the London thing. Yeah, the London thing that we did with the <laughs> self with the self advocates there, um, where where taught where we we did a lot of role plays and and learning from their stories. 
Exactly. So all these self-advocates, as Crystal said, um, shared stories, filled out evaluations that you'll hear about talking about their decision making rights. Um, and uh, there's Crystal in the front. We just had a fun day. And Paul, what's going on here? This is from Ottawa. This is from one of our posts that we do with Ottawa with respect to rights. They, most of them are self-advocate and the support staff in the background. And you probably see a lawyer to name Carrie in the background yeah. too, which is Nika. So it's amazing, like these, these opportunities to meet with people like Paul said, so we flew to um, Ottawa um, and then we were doing a lot of online um, groups with them, but this amazing group and those were the most complicated sessions we ever did because everything had to be translated into French. So not only were we taking legal rights, taking what the law says, making it plain language, but then also <laughs> translating it into French and doing so while doing role plays. So very interesting, but we had very, very good feedback. Um, great information. Everybody here has really helped um, with information. And Shanika, where are we here? We might not have Shanika there. We're, we're, this is Toronto. This is oh, our, um, sorry. oh, there you are, Shanika. Yeah, I was muted, sorry. Uh, this, is our, this is our Toronto group. Um, they're there at the office learning about their rights as well. And this, this was a pretty small, I think that uh, a lot of people had left before we took a photo, but some of these groups were, uh, were pretty big. So we'll, we'll keep on going. We want to say a huge thank you because um, we can't do any of this without allies. So this is why it's also great talking with you guys today. It's so critical to have staff who are putting rights first and foremost in the work they do. So in our London group, Vicki Pearson, who I always say is one of my heroes. Vicki's been doing self-advocacy for a very long time and Vicki coordinated the group bringing self-advocates together and did a fantastic job of, of helping people come together. Jose Belanger, another hero. These are all heroes right here. Jose Belanger has just worked tirelessly around the clock bringing self-advocates together and supporting them. Um, Jose also coordinates Danio, uh, the Disability Advocacy Network of Eastern Ontario. And Jose Belanger, by the way, fun fact, is the, uh, the director of the movie um, Freedom Tour. Jose is also a filmmaker and is doing her PhD on, um, on disability rights. Tara Bates, another superstar, rock star, hero, um, helped coordinate the Toronto group. Without these, these regional supports, we wouldn't have been able to do it. Self-advocates, um, everyone that you just met, our team um, decided on topics that were most important. So relationships, money, healthcare, daily decisions. These were all the areas where we really wanted to explore how people are being supported to make their own decisions. And Hina, can you say a few words about the laws that apply? Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> so um, the topics that the self-advocates wanted us to cover, they seemed simple enough. It was decision-making rights in four areas, uh, relationship, money, health, and daily living. But the actual concepts and issues that we discussed were often part of a really legally complex scheme. So again, this is why it was so important to ensure that we were presenting the information in an accessible manner, uh, which meant plain language for many of our self-advocates. So um, I'm just gonna briefly mention the different laws and acts that we discussed through our series of sessions uh, with self-advocates, just to kind of show you how much we really um, focused on the law. So we talked about human rights as the backdrop of everything. So that included international agreements, such as the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. This is an international agreement that Canada signed on to in 2010. So it's really the backdrop of everything that we do. Uh, a lot of the times the topics that we discuss led us to talk about human rights laws. So uh, this is really important because human rights laws are what we call quasi constitutional laws, which means they take primacy over most other laws in Ontario. So human rights apply to service providers, so they apply to all developmental service agencies. So it's really important to make sure that self-advocates were aware of their human rights and how it applies when they're receiving services. 
Uh, sometimes self-advocates told us about various situations that they experienced that could amount to discrimination. So at times we actually uh, wandered into the federal sphere and sometimes we talked about what's called the Canadian Human Rights Act. So for example, one self-advocate shared an incident about discrimination at the bank, which required uh, talking about their human rights in the federal sphere. So we covered, a, we really did have a focus on human rights uh, throughout the, the nine or 10 or so sessions. We talked about accommodations, about how to prevent and remove individual and systemic barriers. Uh, we covered concepts such as the duty to accommodate and its different components. Uh, we also talked about the key legislation in the developmental services sector. And it's got a really long name. It's called the Services and Supports to Promote the Social Inclusion of Persons with Developmental Disabilities Act. No one ever says the full name. It's just called the Social Inclusion Act for the most part. So yeah, this is a main uh, legislation in this area and it's got regulations underneath it. So we discuss this a lot as well because it really stipulates who is entitled to services and supports and how they can apply for these services and supports. Um, so it really, it talks about um, how to make sure everything's high quality. And then on top of that, there's a lot of policy directives and guidelines from the Ministry of Children, Community and Social Services that we also covered. And then a lot of the situations led us to talk about decision-making and mental capacity and there's at least three acts under there. They're listed on the slide, but it was, it was really a complex legal scheme that we wandered into a lot of the times based on the questions. Which is exactly why having lawyers like Hina and Carrie Joffe and Rob Latanzio um, at our disposal with respecting rights is such a gift. And um, Several, Hina, Hina was amazing. Several self-advocates, um, you know, would, would call with issues. Hina would listen, be sitting there with her lawyer ears, be listening during our workshops and our role plays and think, okay, there's where this person could use some legal support. And then people would contact Hina, sometimes a lot. Hina, you got a lot of phone calls sometimes, didn't you? Um, and uh, that's the beautiful thing about the lawyers working with the respecting rights is that they are working in an accessible way. Some of you guys might know this, Rob Latanzio, who's the executive director of ARCH, when he very first started working with us in self-advocacy, I remember calling him up and saying, can we do a workshop on rights? And I thought, what am I getting myself into? It's a lawyer. No one's going to understand him. Asking him to come into a room as self-advocates. I thought, this is probably going to be a nightmare. But you want to know what he did? He walked into that room. And Paul, you were probably there. I think this may have been before your time, Shanika and Crystal. But he got people doing role plays about um, wanting to have toast in the morning in their group home and talked about how that relates to the law. Then he had everyone go on a wild goose chase to see if they could find a uh, complaint pamphlet in the uh, location that we were in. Nobody could find a complaint pamphlet, but he brought all this back into the law and taught about their legal rights. So this is a beautiful thing. So Hina does such an amazing job of making this accessible and helping people. So as I said, a lot of our self-advocates during the course of, um, of all these workshops would call Hina between say, Hina, you know when you were talking about that, I think I actually have an issue here. Um, just to take a quick look at our research questions again, we're going to get to the questions where we interact with you guys. So keep taking notes on questions you have, okay? Um, but in doing our project, we wanted to find out, number one, is it possible to create supported decision-making circles for people. So where if somebody is in a situation where they're having their rights denied to make their own decisions, and as Hina just finished saying, where the laws were not being protected, so their legal rights were not being protected. If somebody's having that situation, can we help them have a circle to help them make a decision um, rather than having the rights taken away to make that decision? Did people learn anything new at our workshops? Uh, do respect to rights workshops help people, right? Like all the basic stuff you want to look at in evaluation and, and do our workshops help people to be more involved in decisions about their life? Um, and um, 
Alrighty, I'm doing, I think I'm doing this one too. So just, just briefly. So we wanted a third party evaluator to, to take a look at this. We brought Evianz on Evianz, which is formerly the Canadian Disability Studies um, uh, Center. Is that over there? Yeah, Center. So, um, so we brought them in. Cam Crawford, some of you guys might know, um, very well respected disability rights researcher. Um, he's also a prof in disability studies at Ryerson now. So he used to live in a large community. So we brought him on. Self-advocates filled up forms after every question. And then uh, Cam also met with self-advocates afterwards on Zoom to get more information. Um, we hoped to bring all of our communities together, but the pandemic happened. Um, so we've been meeting on Zoom with self-advocates across the province, but we never had to, got to have our big party Right, Paul and Shanika yep. and Crystal, we were really wanting to have our big party. That's right. Oh my God, we were so we kept thinking we're gonna have a big party. I swear, one day we will. Okay, so the results of our evaluation report. So here's what we're here to talk about. So, is it possible to create supportive decision making circles? The findings support that people found my voice, my choice, very rewarding and they absolutely want to keep getting together in a circle to make their decisions. It was amazing the kinds of things that we saw people supporting each other about decisions. Some amazing success stories. And Paul, you want to talk about this one? So this one we did with it um, in the picture you see, you see Sue the staff and you see this person which is a soft advocate. This is what we talked about. We listen to each other's story about the way their decision making. Self advocates can draw, draw the picture of what's important to them. So the one that would, what we mean, people can tell how they feel. They can say they're happy, are they sad, or what you know, things like that. There was a lot of um, a lot of emotion in it. Sometimes people were angry, they were upset, they were sad, and sometimes people were happy. Um, we certainly had some good laughs. We'll show you some pictures of that in a minute. Um, so here you see Carrie Joffe, one of our lawyers. So Carrie's there. We would break into small groups. Carrie's there having a discussion, listening for the legal rights issues that come out. And in the other, in the background, you see Paul Cochran there, and. Um, and Shanika, do you want to just let us know what's it say on this slide? Oh, so our kids says they really like listening to each other, talking to lawyers about their rights. We have the right to speak about how we feel and not judge. Yeah, and no, no judgment, right? So. You know, people have talked about all kinds of things and uh, the self advocates who you're meeting here today, you know, really were amazing at being non judgmental and supporting them. Um, excellent. And um, he so in, yeah, so in terms of the results of our evaluation report, the second question, which was really important for me when I was talking about all the legal rights, is have people learned any new information or skills from our workshops? And um, we're really happy to report that most participants, 83% said yes, they learned something new about their rights um, at the My Voice, My Choice sessions. So for example, I think it was about 20% who said they learned about their rights in a general sense. Another 20% that said they learned about specific rights based on the various topics that we were covering. And uh, some of the really other things that I, I liked in the report is that uh, self-advocates said that they felt it was really important to speak up and tell their story and that they realize how important it is to share what they want or what they don't want with their with staff, with their families, with their friends. Another thing that we really emphasized is that um, this is a two-way street. So you have to treat others respectfully, which includes staff and family and caregivers. And that's something we always emphasize throughout our workshops. And we think we, that message came across. Um, and then lastly, another thing we le really learned about how the new information that people said they learned, they said they learned about supporting other people. 
So they learned how to do this and that how important it was to share what they feel, but also to listen to what other people feel. So these are, so it was really promising to know that there were new things that self-advocates learned from our workshops. And it was beautiful watching the brainstorming that would go on in the group when, um, when an issue would come up, right? The, the brainstorming is like, okay, how can we help you? It was, it was a beautiful thing. Um, okay. And, um, all right. So just, just to look briefly, and by the way, you are all going to have this emailed to you. So if you're interested in all this information, Jason, as Jason, just so you know, I think some of the self-advocates call you uncle Jason. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> uncle Jason will be sending this to you. <laughs> um, so, uh, you will, you will be getting this. Um, uh, so just a little tiny bit more about it. So when we were looking at the question of the respecting rights workshops about supported decision making, help people. Really interesting here. Um, so 50% or 57% said they feel a lot more confident and no one said they felt less confident after attending the sessions. When we started out, I'll never forget, and Shanika, Paul, Crystal, you guys will all remember this, um, and Hina, they, the very first Ottawa, workshop we did and we said tell us about your rights tell us about like what are some of the experiences in in your having your rights respected where you live and one woman said i remember she laughed and uh, this is a self-advocate in ottawa and she said there are no rights there are no rights and uh so the more she spoke we saw she was really really despondent like just really Anytime she tried advocating, she got shut down. And um, so that's one person is that she just was deflated. She said, you know what, I've tried and I've tried and I've tried. But the funny thing is she's actually moved out of that group home. She was really struggling there in Ottawa. She's now in an amazing place. And uh, we're so happy to hear how well she's doing. Even over the pandemic, she actually did great um, and was able to see her mom. Um, so good stuff. All right, um, and number 24, so this, this slide here. Um, so Crystal, I'm gonna ask you to read out those quotes at the bottom. I'll just let you know the beginning. So do the Respecting Rights Workshops help people to be more involved in their decisions? So a lot of self-advocates participated so they have thought about advocating even if they're nervous to get in trouble from the staff, but nearly half of the people said they would ask questions or speak up for themselves. Again, so many people talked about feeling scared to advocate, and we'll tell you about that in a minute. But Crystal, what are these quotes what? down here? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, say what's on my mind more often. Maybe talk to my residential staff about having control of my money, I would talk about my feelings to advocate for myself. Yeah, so, and there's, you might have questions about that. And again, we're gonna have, we're gonna leave a good swath of time at the end for, for questions. You might have questions for Hina, our lawyer, or for our self-advocates for me. So if you have questions about these things, cause I know a lot of people think, yeah, some people, do we really want them having control of their money, right? But we've seen so many situations where people can be supported to actually be involved in decisions about their lives and the empowering, the empowering that it does is amazing. So Crystal, can you tell us now, everybody probably sees that and thinks, oh my God, I want one of those cookies. Well, I want one of those. <laughs> well, in every, in every um, time when we, when, when we work with the self-advocates and that the staff provide foods and, and, and coffee and stuff, especially cookies. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, it's one of these things, Peter Park, um, founder of People First and really our mentor and advisor, um, you know, always talks about bringing the humanity into these sessions and having food, trying to have music, 
Actually, Shanika, we should have a slide here on Queen. You know, <laughs> <laughs> Shanika loves Queen, so we would actually play music at the uh, at the end too. Um, but it's so important those pieces. So that's Crystal in London with us, some great food, and that's Jose yeah. Belanger over there in uh, in Ottawa with some of that great food. And Crystal, can you read this one for us? Yeah, uh, respecting rights has been using role plays and arts and rights education for many years. We decided to study how our work helps people with intellectual disabilities learn about decision making rights. Yeah, like Crystal said, we've been doing this for a long time. So that's actually Paul and Shanika back in Surrey Place. I don't know if you guys remember that. We were in Surrey Place a long time ago, um, I think. Or that might be at Arch too. But anyway, it was pre-pandemic. It was pre-pandemic. Um, speaking of the laughs, Shanika, what's going on here? Uh, we're doing some <laughs> little bit of role play, you know? Um, um, someone to have a baby, I believe. Exactly. And it's and you can see that's Yvonne Spicer, a uh, very active self-advocate, having a really good belly laugh. Um, and uh, I think Beverly beside her. So yeah, like Shanika said, that you know, people got to choose what some of the issues that they wanted to role play were. And with the lawyer there, then we kind of break down what the rights issues are. And this one, as Shanika said, was about having a baby. I think they were having fun because I think Yvonne, was Yvonne the pregnant one? And maybe Beverly was the mother and yeah. maybe... Yeah, Jason there was the, the boyfriend. Yeah, uh, that's right, true. Yeah. It was good fun, right? So we, we also really believe in having a lot of fun. Crystal, you are such an advocate for relationship rights. Yes, Would you read this one out for us? Yes. So everyone said they learned something new in our sessions on, re on relationship decisions 100%. So relationships are important and we need to be heard. Exactly. And Crystal's been such a strong advocate about people having the right to be involved in their own decisions when it comes to relationships. And Deanna, uh, you and all your ongoing work with the relationship working group, you'd be interested in knowing of all of the different areas of rights, relationship decisions was the one where every single person, like Crystal said, 100% of people said that they learned something new about their right to be in their own decisions. So uh, amazing, you know, we think that people know you have the right to be in, in a relationship, but actually a lot of people actually learned a lot about that in our sessions. Um, and by the way, that's two of our self-advocates, um, Chris and, uh, and Suzanne there. And I have to say one of the most beautiful things to me, um, kind of a success story, um, when the pandemic hit, Chris was really struggling to get online. All he wanted was to see his girlfriend, Suzanne, and she was living with her sister. So it took a lot of work wrangling to try and connect them through the staff at the group home. And you might even be here today, some of you staff who helped Chris get online and Suzanne um, at her sister's place and seeing them actually see each other's faces on the Zoom call the first time was amazing. So I would set up a, a, a Zoom call and then I would actually make them the host and leave so that they could just have a private date online. Um, lovely. So, so important that people do have the right to be in their own relationships. But just another thing, all quotes are anonymous. So everybody who shared their information with us in our evaluation, uh, no names are in the report. And then I'm going to ask self-advocates to share these important things. So here's quotes that we got directly from self-advocates across the province. Um, so Crystal, can I ask you to read out that first one? Yep. I need to speak up to my family to let them know what's important to me. So as basic as that sounds, some people really didn't think that they were allowed to do that. Right. So having an opportunity to talk about it um, brought that to them. And Paul, can I ask you to read out the second one? Sure, I can. Um, that we are allowed to complain about the funniest of farmers. 
that we're allowed to complain about financial problems. We, there's all kinds of issues that we heard about um, and people, again, didn't know that they were allowed to complain. And we can talk to you a little bit about that later. And then Shanika, can you read the next one? I learned that I can um, advocate and stand up for, for yourself and supporting your wish, bold and decision making. Beautiful, thank you. And then that people have rights. As I said, somebody in our very first session said rights, there are no rights. So having a lawyer there to actually say, no, actually, here's what the law says. You actually do have rights. So we just need to educate people about that. Um, and then I think, you know, just a real beautiful heartwarming one is I'm important. What I think matters, right? So important. What I think matters. Um, there's a little example of what our evaluations look like. Um, was it boring, interesting? Was it in between or so-so? And this particular person clicked off interesting. And then what did you like most about today's session? I loved feeling important and needed with my friends. So I tell you, I'm still getting lots and lots and lots of phone calls and messages from everybody wanting to keep getting together because they don't have avenues, especially during the pandemic, right? The social connection is so important. Um, and, um, and then taking a look at this one, so art by self-advocate. So we also brought art supplies in and people could do some art. So, you know, there's a thundercloud here when I'm depressed. Sometimes I feel lonely. I want to feel loved. I want to be happy. Um, now we're going to get into talking with you about the artwork that contains the overall themes that came out of the evaluations. So with these themes. This artwork was done. We had this created and meeting with self-advocates. A high school student uh, created these along with self-advocates input. Um, you'll see going up the side of this big black figure here holding the holding a finger up. It's a dark shadow, this ominous dark shadow, and it says don't complain or else with a big shh. And then Shanika, can you read out this quote? This is a quote that came directly from one of our self-advocates. Can you read that out, Shanika? Is it worth complaining? We know we're getting in trouble. If we speak up, that will tell us to be quiet. It worsens when you speak up. Right. So Shanika just said there, it's not worth complaining. We know we'll get in trouble if we speak up. Staff tell us to be quiet and it's worse when you speak out. Um, so Hina could talk a whole lot and maybe we can do a little bit more discussion about that at the end of this, about what the law says about people's right to complain and that people aren't supposed to be getting in trouble. Hina, can you say, I, I'm putting you on the spot, one word about reprisal and why this, why this slide is so important? Yeah, so um, this slide, this one really kind of shocked me because the Ontario Human Rights Code, it actually explicitly protects from reprisal or threats of reprisal. So reprisal meaning, you know, any sort of action or threat that's intended as a retaliation for claiming or enforcing your rights. So hearing quotes like this, talking to self-advocates, we knew that this is one of those big areas that needs to be addressed for self-advocates in a more systemic way than just one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. Yeah. And this, this, here really brings us to our next phase. So we're going to show you some more artwork uh, containing the primary themes that came out of our the, out of this research. But these are the primary themes, and it leads directly into okay, where to, and what's our next step? Um, okay, Paul, can you read yep. this one? So okay. You... Yeah, we feel like we feel like we are in jail. We are not allowed to make our our own decision about our own lives. Right. So again, just doing that bit of a reflection on how is this for people with disabilities, right? So sometimes staff talk about, oh, it's much safer and easier for them if we just control those decisions. And of course, there's very, very, very challenging, challenging, risky situations sometimes people 
make decisions about. But this is the general feeling. And this, this was a theme that came across out of all of the evaluations that, um, that came out. And again, this is a quote directly um, that came out from a self-advocate. Uh, Crystal, um, there are big champion of decision-making rights. Can you read this one? Yes. So we got to choose who we have relationships with, and it doesn't matter what gender. It matters about the per. It matters of the person. Exactly. So you know that was a learning. Somebody didn't <coughs> didn't know that before. So they said, "Oh, wow, we actually get to choose who we have relationships with." <coughs> okay, and Shanika, can you read this one? So, um, if all people with disability made complaint, it would be even from uh, bad uh, retinal exploding just because so many people have complained and don't they don't make it. So yeah, this was a huge one that came out, and again, reflecting reflecting people all across the province. If all the people with disabilities make complaints, it would be a volcano exploding because so many people have complaints that they don't make, right? Because they just think it's not worth it. Like Hina said, you know, they think that there's going to be a reprisal. They're going to get in trouble. There's going to be backlash. So people just hold these things in. And Paul, this one? We need more time for small group talks. For this That's picture, in this picture, you see people gather on the table, four, um, four different groups to talk about their seats, about their lives and seeing what they have to complain about. Yeah, so that's, it was really clear. So it's like people don't really need to uh, sit there like what we're doing right now, this presentation, we would never do this with our self-advocates. With our self-advocates, it's all about interaction, going back and forth. Um, people just need to talk, small group talks. And then as they were saying in those quotes, they feel important because they're able to offer advice and help each other. Um, so that was really important. So here comes the exciting part of our presentation. Da, 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 da. Um, what is next? Okay. So um, let me see here. Uh, okay, I'll say I'll say a few words, um, and then I'm going to turn it over to Hina. I think for the next one. But so all the self advocates told us they want to keep going. They need to have this connection. It's not just for fun. It's critical for their for their decision making rights. They feel like there's serious, serious issues that are happening when they're not connected. Um, so we're looking at having advisory regional groups for self advocates, right? So that those groups that we've already started with, we'll look at having them in an advisory role for our next phase. We're looking at having regional representatives. So those self-advocates who rose to leadership positions in those different communities to uh, join in a more leadership oriented role. And where I'm so excited and all the self-advocates, we've been talking about this forever, partnering with agencies. So our next phase, what we're planning to do is to do work as you heard, especially that volcano, right? If, so many people have complaints they don't have an opportunity to make. So we are exploring and we're just in the process of talking with a few agencies. And if any of you are in a progressive agency where you might know um, a program or somebody who might be interested in being involved in this, we are looking at you know either creating a bill of rights where self-advocates have say in supporting and helping develop a bill of rights or if the agency already has a bill of rights, um, working on how do we infuse an accessible complaint mechanism into that bill of rights, right? So Hina can talk a little bit more about the law around that and complaint mechanisms, but we really want to explore that and then do some really good, strong, evaluative research, just like we did with this phase. And so with that, we would be looking at simulations, right? So testing out simulations with self-advocates at the wheel, helping us with our lawyers, guiding us, and developing it or co-designing that with agencies. So that's going to be super exciting. And I think that we have the ability to make some incredible change. Um, so we want to hear from you guys. Make notes because uh, we're going to get to our question period in just a minute. And Hina, 
Right. So the, the, our first phase of My Voice, My Choice, it focused more on education as well as supported decision making, because in order to know what choices self-advocates have, uh, they must know what choices they have a right to make. But now in working with agencies as a next step, um, as Sue said, our goals are in line with what we learned from self-advocates. And what we're really trying to do is extrapolate those problems to address issues that require a larger reform of the laws and the system. So um, some of the things that we're looking into with working with agencies. So our goal is to address uh, some of the barriers. So remove some of the barriers that people have to, so that they can be more involved in their lives. So just based on um, from phase one, some of the barriers that we heard about, uh, there's huge barriers to autonomous decision making. So too often it's service providers, family members, and guardians that want to help uh, those in the developmental services sector. But the way that they approach it is as a, we know what's best for you situation. And that essentially undermines independent decision making and it denies people that sort of right to make their own choices. And the other one that we've already sort of touched on is the fear of abuse, retaliation and reprisal. So that's another sort of barrier that we want to address in working with an agency. Uh, this, is, this is a complicated one because basically due to the nature of the services and supports that uh, people require, and the environments in which the services are delivered, many people with disabilities do fear being abused or threatened if they make a complaint. So our goal is to really work through an agency's complaints process and see how to address these issues about um, how this dependence uh, makes people feel really vulnerable and how to, how to resolve that. And then another thing that our goal is, is to also address some of the limitations that are currently in the Social Inclusion Act through working with agencies. And what I mean by that is when the Social Inclusion Act was passed, um, its ultimate goal was to transform the developmental services sector, but there are limitations to the act. Uh, for example, the act, um, it doesn't actually enshrine the rights of persons with developmental disabilities when they receive developmental services and supports. Uh, there's a lot of different acts in different areas that do enshrine a bill of rights. For example, in the long-term care home sector, in the attendant services sector, there's a bill of rights right in the legislation. There isn't something similar for the developmental services sector. And it's important because it really helps um, accountability Another thing that we're gonna address that's not very clear in the act is the lack of a robust mechanism to enforce the rights of persons with disabilities. So in this context, the rights that I'm talking about are the day-to-day -day rights. So um, those that are specific to the developmental services <clears throat> sector and the supports, uh, not so much human rights, because those always apply and they're always in the background. So we're really trying to address a complaint mechanism that's more person-centered than what's in the current act right now that has um, you know, mandatory reporting requirements, it has inspections, but it's not, it's not so much focused on the person with the disability. So those are some of our, our goals for the second phase of our project. And we really, we hope to work with a couple really progressive agencies to work through these. And it's, I, I think it's a great opportunity. So Hina outlined that really beautifully. I think it's an amazing opportunity for an agency to be involved in really being a change maker. Um, and uh, we're speaking with a few people. There's a couple of agencies who uh, across the province who've been involved with us for a while. So we're only going to be selecting a few. Um, but if you know an agency that might be interested in this, and again, you know, it can be a very scary idea to think, oh my gosh, I don't want to be involved in testing complaints out. Whoa, talk about airing my dirty laundry. But that's why we're looking at creating simulations, right? And the agency doesn't even need to continue on afterwards using that complaint mechanism. It's just where we want to test it out and do that in partnership co-designing with an agency. Um, so that's a super, super exciting next phase. Um, and again, self-advocates involved every step of the way. Um, 
So look at that. I think we're getting toward our questions. I want to do one more thing, Jason. So you know what? We can stop sharing this now, but or just before, um, sorry, just before I do that, please make note, as Hina mentioned earlier, uh, there was an arch alert. Um, we've got all kinds of information and holy moly, the arch website is chock full of incredible resources. So please feel free to go onto that arch website, check it out. Um, also, the Respecting Rights uh, page on there, there's a mailing list. We'll be getting ready and we'll be sending out information on, ongoing on our, on our project. So please feel free to sign up for the Respecting Rights um, email list. And um, that's on there. And also the videos. Um, so Jason and Deanna can talk later about the fact you guys will be getting this PowerPoint sent to you. Uh, and we'll also make a point of sending you those videos that we didn't get to. Um, we can air some of, there's no questions, but I have a feeling there may be a few questions to, just beforehand. Um, I will stop sharing now. Um, please reach out to us. I'll, I'll share my email if you want more direct information about, um, about uh, respecting rights. But I'd also just like to point out um, can we spotlight Josh Colick for one quick second, if that's okay? Uh, because we all introduced ourselves, um, but we did not uh, introduce Josh Colick, who is joining us. Uh, Josh is a longtime developmental services worker at APSW, and Josh is joining our Respecting Rights team as a Master's of Social Work student in January. Do you want to say a quick hello, Josh? Yeah, hi everyone. I'm really excited to be uh, coming on board, and, and this is a great project and something I'm obviously really passionate about. My work is now a protective service worker and in the field, and um, really excited for uh, January to come and get on board. So there you go. Wanted to make sure that we uh, also introduce Josh. Um, okay, we are going to turn it over uh, to Deanna and Jason, Uncle Jason, as it were, um, <laughs> to uh, do a little bit of um, Q and A. Anything else? Uh, why don't I turn it right over to you, Deanna? Thank you, everyone, so much. I'll turn it right over to you, Deanna. Okay. So I just want to let everyone know that this has been recorded. And we'll be editing and adding closed captioning and uploading it to Connectability. When that becomes available, I will most certainly send you a link along with the PowerPoint presentation when that happens so you can get both at the same time. If you're really itching for that um, PowerPoint, I will be sending it out after to the, to the list of folks who signed up today. Um, I'll be sending that out right after the presentation. Uh, please check your uh, junk box. I have a feeling a lot of folks got their junk box populated by my lovely link to this presentation or maybe navigated it. So if you've made it on now, which is great, thank you for, for your patience. Um, it's come to my attention that maybe some junk box uh, emails for Zoom link happened. Part of the tech fun. So questions. Um, <clears throat> I guess see Hina answered one already, so I don't have to worry too, too much. Uh, here we go. So from Sarah, can you speak a bit about how to support people who may have more significant disabilities with decision making and consent if they are unable to communicate this in a traditional manner? Why don't we uh, turn that one over to Hina? Yeah. So that's actually a really great question because it shows that you're turning your mind to the different ways that persons might, might communicate. So um, of course there's different um, communication devices that people use. Uh, I've had a clients that use, uh, use like a, a board with letters on it, like a bliss board. And for things like that, what's really important is to have in-person meetings. And I know that's very difficult uh, nowadays, but that's, that's one of the accommodations for my client that I would have is in-person meetings. But for clients that have these, um, they have a variety of accommodation needs. They might need shorter meetings. They might need multiple meetings. Uh, for some, it is plain language, but it's not for everyone. Uh, one thing that we've really emphasized is having um, sort of a supported decision-making circle. Mm -hmm. So this is having a, a circle around the person with a disability of people that he or she trusts, and that can really help um, communicate what the, what the client is seeking. 
So a supported decision-making circle has been a pretty effective uh, situation in the past. There's also a more formal version of this called a microboard, which is, um, it's essentially a supported decision-making circle, but it's, it's a little bit more formal that some people have. So they have a, almost a team of persons to help them um, share what, they're, what they need. But uh, what's really important to keep in mind here is to make sure you're actually getting, um, you're learning what the person wants and not what their friend or family interprets they want. So it is, it is a thin line and it's, it's a lot more work for a worker or a lawyer, but um, it's, it's definitely worth it in the end because you get, you get actually what the person is feeling and communicating to you. Any more questions, folks? I know there's been challenges with the link. You absolutely heard, we understand. I think our challenge is we have capped at 100 people. So we were concerned about people sharing the link and then not the, you know, the people that registered wouldn't get in. So we will resolve that issue next time, okay? I promise. But again, we recorded it, it's all good. You'll be able to see it later. Um, Sue shared a link, or sorry, Jason shared a link to the video. If you wanna take a look there. Does anyone have any more questions? We have about 15 more minutes. Um, Okay, question from Curtis. Hi. Yeah. Someone's chiming in and caller user one, go ahead. I don't know if it's me or not, it's Denise calling. Sure, Denise, go ahead, Denise. I just, um, sorry, I missed the piece about the evaluating um, capacity. If there are concerns about the person's capacity to make certain decisions that are, that could be risky. Was there a piece on that? So um, generally in the law, there's a presumption that uh, everybody has capacity, uh, but there, if there are questions about capacity, the legal framework is, uh, it's mostly the Substitute Decisions Act. So this sort of provides the legal framework for how a person who has capacity can grant a power of attorney. This could be for personal care or it could be for property. And then it also talks about what happens in periods of incapacity. So there's things about guardian guardianship that's in the Healthcare Consent Act. So those sort of specific, uh, if there's any specific questions you have about that, we can possibly connect one-on-one -on -one offline, but there are, there's a lot of uh, a legal framework for capacity sort of decisions. Yes, sorry, I should have identified myself. I'm, I'm with the Public Guardian's Office Investigations Unit. Okay. So I am I'm aware of all the, the legislation that also allows our office to act, but I just wanted to ensure that folks participating know that it, there's a presumption of capacity, but if there's evidence to the contrary, that it's really important to be sure of that capacity, especially if there's decisions being made that may put the person or their finances at risk. And thank you. And and uh, I, it's I know very. This is like the most complicated thing. I do, um, you know, or I used to uh, in my former role at an agency do the um, staff orientation on rights for all new staff that were coming on board. And I would always end off my my session saying, "You have chosen the most." complicated area of mental health supports. If anybody coming into developmental services, capacity and consent, it's the most complicated area. Obviously, you know, you're at Public Guardian. Um, and we've had uh, so many people um, come to Arch and that who were on PGT, who who are with the Public Guardian and trustee, um, who want to make changes to that and it turns out that they they do have capacity but they have to go through that whole process so i mean hina i don't know if you want to offer anything about it's not our go-to to say go get a capacity assessment and have their have their guard have guardianship put in place right like we really don't advise because it's so difficult to change that around hina do you want to add anything about that sort of legally yeah, so um, the the acts in the area, they actually say that if there's an alternative to the public guardian and trustee, that you must follow that alternative. So our focus is really seeing what alternatives exist and how to properly accommodate the client and how to properly, um, to make sure that there's ways that this person can have their rights uh, heard, that can share their, their 
they can get support to make their decisions. Mm -hmm. And um, there are situations where the person cannot, but a lot of the times, and I would say more often than not, if as long as there's the right supports in place, the person can be involved in the decision making in their own lives. Yes, absolutely. And I agree with that. And we should always, the public guardian should always be the last option because it's not always, um, it, it, it's not the best option, but um, we, I only get involved, our unit only gets involved if there's serious risk. And unfortunately, sometimes we see situations where people say, well, this is what they want. So we have to go with it. They want to leave and have absolutely no support, but they may need extra supports in order to be safe. So just wanted to make sure folks participating are also aware of that piece because uh, I don't want to investigate any more situations where, for instance, someone's appointed a power of attorney um, and if things are going fine, that's great. But if there are concerns with the power of attorney and there are concerns about the person's capacity to appoint, that's when I think those things really need to be looked at. But that's that's a whole other whole other session. But I just want to make sure folks are aware that if there's a presumption of capacity, yes, there is for everyone. But if there's evidence of incapacity and that also needs to be considered. Do you want, do you want to speak to that, Hina? Or should we just go into... Um... Yeah, yeah, I think that that's a fair statement. So I think we can just go into the next question. Yeah, no, it, it is. And thank you. And it's, it's um, you know, I mean, we've, we've done these workshops for many years with lawyers in different situations where we've had so many, so many families and staff say, um, you know, it's so much easier if the person doesn't have the right to make their own decisions, if they're making these risky, these risky choices where they're going to be homeless. They're going to be, and I mean, look at Josh sitting there. Josh, you support so many people who make risky decisions as an APSW. I know Josh uh, has certainly had his hands full on supporting people to make their own decisions, um, but plugging those supports in. So it's not like, okay, so somebody's saying that they do want to continue to consume crack. They do want to continue to, like, whatever it is that's really risky. We don't turn our backs on and say, okay, that's fine. That's their choice got to plug the supports in. They need supports. So if it's a harm reduction program, whatever else it is, right? But people need supports. It's not black or white that they've said that they want to go skating without a helmet on. And uh, right, so we, we have to plug in supports and it's not easy. Um, any any other, thank you, excellent. So glad you're here. Thank you for being here. It's great. So a few other questions. Yeah. One from Curtis, you spoke about people commonly feeling afraid to speak out. You also mentioned people felt more confident after attending the workshops. What has helped people gain confidence to speak out? Anybody like Crystal, Shanika, Paul, if, if there's anything like I'll, can I go first on my first observation of that? My, my first observation is having a team. Right. So having seeing other people believe in them and people be around them. When you watch that little video of the person talking about his relationship, you'll see him looking around at the group saying, you guys have been talking about my rights with all of you guys. And so guess what I've done? And then you'll hear him tell the story. But it's knowing that he's not alone. So many people told us across the province that they feel isolated that they feel like there's no one to go to, so they don't make their own decisions. They just don't do anything. They just kind of clam down. Um, but I think, and anybody else chime in, but I think a, a big part of it, I think there's two things. It's having that network of peer support, self-advocates, like Paul said earlier, people want to be in small groups and talk to each other. I'm not alone, thank God. And then having a lawyer there saying, yeah, actually here's what the law says, right? So I think it's the legal rights and like learning about the law and learning that they're supported through another group. Any Anybody else from Respecting Rights want to chime in on that one? I'll just say that I think part of what really helped increase people's confidence is they would bring a situation either they experienced or someone they know experienced and we would act it out. So the role play piece. So the role play piece allowed uh, different people to to react in the, how they would naturally react in the situation. And then we were able to apply the legal rights to that, to say why this is a good way to react, why that's not a good way to react, what your actual rights are in that scenario. So I think just that understanding, that playing it out, that seeing it happen in a situation either they were involved in or know about, really instill that confidence. So when they face a similar situation in the future, they kind of know what to do. They have a framework for what to do. 
Great. Um, next question from Amal. You mentioned earlier that respecting rights provided participant, uh, participation, participants with workshops about their rights. Can you, uh, can other agencies host the arch rights workshops for their participants as well? Or was this only part of the study? Oh, great question. Thanks, Amal. So um, if you asked Paul and Shanika and Crystal, you know, a couple years ago um, about going and doing workshops, we got so many requests. We were running around like chickens with our heads cut off going from agency to agency to agency doing these workshops. And then we got the funding and we decided, let's research this. Let's research, let's study what we're doing, right? So then we, we've just spent the last year really focusing in on researching and studying what's, uh, what the outcomes of our, of our sessions are. So um, we will most likely get back to that. Um, this was our first foray in coming out and speaking to staff again since doing our, our evaluation project. Um, we also have, if you know family members, um, and we can send it to you. Deanna, I can even send this to you to include with it on October, I think it's October 22nd, eh, Hina? Um, we're doing uh, this same session, but for family members um, on the evening of October 22nd. That's going to be for family members. Um, so, and that's the one where we earn our money because uh, <laughs> family members have lots of questions about guardianship. Um, but, um, so yeah, so get get in touch and we can explore doing other sessions. Obviously, you know, we can do them province wide now because they're on Zoom, right? But um, so yeah, we, we will go back to doing those. We've just been so busy doing this stuff. But thanks for your question, Amal. Uh, yeah, Curtis just said, thank you for your response to information. Paula asked, are you able to share your evaluation framework? Sure, yeah. Um, yeah, we can, we can, by the way, if anybody's interested, we can send the whole report out. It's a slog, you know, it's like a 45 page read, right? <laughs> if anybody wants that kind of torture, happy to send it out. Absolutely. Um, yeah, so get in touch if you're interested in, in uh, bedtime reading. We're more than happy to send that out. <laughs> Good, so they can contact you, Sue, for that information? Yep, yep, contact me. You've got, you've got my email. Paula's saying not a slog at all. Paula <laughs> is a research geek, I can tell. Okay. So uh, it's Great. certainly, yeah, and yeah. it'll be published. It's going to be like a published and it's going to be available, but yeah, we can, um, we can, uh, we can share that. Great. We're going to, thanks. And I don't see any other questions. There's one individual that I think you'll be able to follow up with privately, Sue. Yep. Great. In the got chat that. feature. Got awesome. It. Anyone got it. else? Got it. Got it. We have five minutes before uh, Zoom shuts down. Oh, really? Yeah, if wow. anyone else has any questions, this has gone fast. If not, they can definitely email you after this presentation. Oh, yeah. For please. more questions. Yep, please do. Yeah, and if you want any more details. Um, so excited. How did you walk through the definitions? What does that mean? I'm not sure. Okay, I'm gonna, I unmuted myself. This is Paula. Okay, I'm great. Paula, me. go. Sorry. Um, Paul, okay. you're there are so many big words that we use in law um, that um, are hard to understand for most people. Um, how did you, and maybe it's in your report, but how did you help everybody um, come to the same place in terms of those understandings around those big words? Oh, yeah. on, on the, the legal education. Yeah, Hina. Yeah, that's a really great question. So um, we worked really hard to make sure every definition was in plain language, and it's an incredibly challenging th thing to do with uh, legal definitions. For example, capacity, just explaining the concept of capacity, explaining the concept of consent. It's, it's a big task, but what we tended to do is we did a lot of repetition. So we would kind of break down the definition, just repeat it over and over again. And we would use real life examples that we would switch around so people really, so everyone could understand what it meant in application. And then so, then so much the nuances of the legal, legal words are not so important as long as you understand the concept at its core. So it was, yeah, it was a great question. It was, it was a very challenging task and uh, I, I hope we did it well for the most part. Great. 
Great question. And by the way, I'm seeing other people who have been involved. I just I switched it over to gallery view to see all of your beautiful shining faces. And I see Petra Asfau, who's been um, who's been such a support in doing uh, graphic recording for uh, for some of our self advocate projects. So great to see you, Petra. Um, great. Anyway, so we wanted to say hi to Petra. And I just want to mention I, I talked about planning in in my chat and. I thank the self-advocate work um, done at Community Living Toronto using the right statement as part of planning. But today, you guys, thank you, have really given me some some more ideas or challenges of how we can, you know, incorporate this really important work into planning. So I just sort of throw that out to everybody. If um, anybody, you know, wants to help with that, especially the um, self-advocates. I know Shanika, you've you've helped already train up a student. So if you guys want to help um, some more to maybe incorporating some of what you've learned into planning so that we can make uh, it better, easier for people to be able to talk about these issues, I'm here for you. <laughs> That's great. We'll, we'll barter. We'll barter with you. <laughs> That's great. Thank you. I mean, we have two, two more minutes. If anyone has any last burning questions or else they'll be reaching out to you guys via email. Absolutely. Please, please reach out. Um, we don't bite. We're very nice. And, uh, and we're very interested in sharing this information and uh, going into next steps. Like I said, our, our most exciting thing that we're looking to do is to partner with agencies, co-design um, and, uh, and move forward. So um, uh, very thrilled to be doing that, but do sign up for our mailing list if you want and the arch alert. Um, so I wanted to say one quick thing, uh, gang, you know, just because I've been speaking most of this time, I haven't personally been looking at the chat function. So email me, um, you know, you've got my email there. Uh, so you may have sent a, a message to me privately and I'm just going to say I didn't, I, I probably won't see it, but please email me and um, we'll get it to you. So before this abruptly ends, you gotta make sure we please. say goodbyes. That's your one thing? Absolutely. I want to say thank you everyone for coming out and thank you for listening to us. Awesome. Happy birthday. Have a great thank day. You. Happy Friday, everyone. If this shuts out, we will definitely, uh, um, you know, it's been a great way to start to end September. Amazing. Thank you so much, everyone. Really looking forward to being in touch. Can I play a song as we roll out? Sure, this is for Shanika. Shanika would uh, like to get everybody up and dancing at our session, so we would often close with this song. So this is for Shanika, and uh, have a great day, everyone. Yep. Bye, everybody.